what makes life bearable, obviously, is giving meaning to this challenge. Otherwise, life is unbearable. My God, we would be just seeking out drugs and pleasure and all the time, which we know where that leads. So um, there's value there. And then, again, the argument that I'm making here is for health and fitness people who are data-driven, forget all the stuff I just said. Look at the data. The data is clear. You want to live longer. You want to be healthier. If you're really pursuing health, that's really what you're after, you cannot deny the data. So at the very least, you should be open-minded and say, okay, there's something here. Yeah. Just like exercise, the data is clear. If somebody tries to debate with me against exercise, I'll show them all the you know data and say, look, here's the deal. Try it out. You got nothing to lose. Be open-minded. All the data says so. The same thing is true of spiritual practice. The data is clear. You live longer. You're healthier. You have better immune system. You, you tend to have worse health problems. You have better relationships. People tend to stay married longer and be happier. They had happier children. This is all proven in in the data. So, you know, it's it's a part of health. So if we're a health, you know, if we're health influencers or podcasts or celebrities or whoever you are, you're a personal trainer coach, you can't deny that. One of the most effective ways to lower depression, improve happiness, reduce blood pressure, make yourself live longer and have better relationships is to have a spiritual practice. This is clinically proven. I know I'm blowing everyone's minds, but a spiritual practice has been proven to improve your health in almost every single parameter that they measure. I had a uh, day in the life yesterday on the the Mind Pump Media IG, and that was actually one of the, I, I posted a picture of the two of you and said, ask anything about Justin or Sal. <clears throat> and they actually asked me, um, you know, what your spiritual practice was. So I, I didn't know you were going to go this direction, but um, I, I answered that I think it was prayer. I said, I didn't know uh, for sure if there was other practices or whatever. Would you guys say that you would, that you, your way of practicing, practicing spirituality? Yes. Mm. And, and you know, what's funny about this is that, well, it's not funny. It's, it's, it's actually quite interesting is that when you pursue fitness, usually you get into it because you're trying to change how you look. So it's kind of starts off as this cosmetic thing, maybe insecurity based, right? Then you go along that path. And if you stick to it long enough, you, you start to develop acceptance because either you're aging or you realize, oh, like if I, I, I'm enjoying this for other reasons. So then you kind of develop this more health oriented, um, you know, context around it. And then it's like, I like the mental effects. I like the psychological effects. And you continue to pursue, pursue health. Eventually you land on spirituality. And what's interesting about this is in our space, there's lots of evidence-based individuals. Like the evidence shows that the data and the data is clear with calories, with proteins, with fats, with carbs. The data is clear with strength training. The data is clear with cardiovascular training. The data is clear with spiritual practices. So forget, and it really, you know, forget the esoteric part, right? The, mm -hmm. the, the mystical aspect of it. People who have a spiritual practice are healthier. They live longer. They have lower rates of depression. Um, they have happier children. This is all in, in clinical data. So a spirit, if you're a health minded person and, and this is something that's important to you, you can't deny the data. There's something there. So I think it's important to be open-minded because if you really want to improve your health, that is such a big chunk. In fact, spiritual practice has as big of an effect on your health as diet and exercise does. Well, I think it provides a lot of things that uh, people uh, sort of seek out in, in um, uh, say that they do it in different sections. Like, so I'm, I'm seeking out purpose and, and, and I'm doing that through work or I'm doing that yeah. through relationships or, you know, or I'm, you know, seeking a way to de-stress. Um, I'm seeking a way to kind of lower my, my overall, uh, just volume of stress and, and prayer itself for me is a bit of a meditative process with that too, which, you know, I do a bit of both, but I mean, they both serve like that same kind of, um, purpose and physiologically, uh, with just stopping and acknowledging, um, you know, things outside of yourself. Uh, and, and, and then also, I mean, um, the, to the first, I just lost yeah, my no train worry. of no, thought. No, no, look, no. So check this out. This is what I think is really important because you're arguing about how, how it makes you feel purpose, meaning. And I think a lot of people understand that, but where people don't get it is, are the measurable physiological effects. For example, if I say to you, eating healthy has been shown to boost immune function in actual studies where they look at things like your, your like T cells and immune cell count, right? Spirituality has done this. There's a study that was done at the University of Los Angeles. I pulled up right now. And it showed that HIV positive patients who meditated slowed down the decline in their immune cell count. Another study found that mindfulness produced demonstrable effects on brain and immune function. So it's not just 
you feel better. It's not just you have a better outlook on things. They can actually measure <clears throat> and show changes in your physiology through a spiritual practice. So what would you connect this to? Because would you connect it more to the power of the mind? Would you connect it more to uh, the foundation of having uh, morals and values and uh, a greater purpose? What would you connect the 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 scientific literature to that, yeah. that the response? So there obviously something is happening where it, the with the people that choose to live a life that is and it does it, it could be any spiritual. They practice. show this with all spiritual, right? Practices. So it doesn't so this doesn't like have meditation. to be one. It's not one religion is right. superior to the other. It's that uh, believing in a higher power and and a purpose and having these kind of moral these moral codes or values yes. in life. What, what do you what do you attribute? Do you think that's just it's because you know mentally the mind is that powerful that if I think positively, if I think that I have this reason and therefore these things happen, or do you think there's something there? I think I think I think it's very complex. I think that's part of it. Um, we've all been in tough situations where you're in this really tough situation, and then you find a way to reframe it, and usually that requires you take a forty thousand foot view of the issue, and then all of a sudden that problem now it goes from unbearable to, uh, it's a driver, right? Or it's motivating or there's, I can see the meaning behind what's going on. That definitely will affect your physiology. Just how you think we've proven that. Um, is there a metaphysical part to it that I don't think you can ever prove the metaphysical part. That's where the faith part comes mm -hmm. in, well, but the practice of the spiritual practices, uh, it has a profound effect. On and like I said, measurable metrics of just health. Which well, I'd argue it does though, in terms of belief. So what does belief do in terms of like, if I, f if I believe that I'm going to get better, if I believe that, you know, that I'm going to heal, if I, if I truly believe in that direction, you see placebo um, effects of that it, physiologically versus somebody who has maybe a negative aspect in their mindset towards um, recovering from certain things. So, so this, I, I, this is an interesting perspective listening to you too because we and because now and i'm like i've formulated my own thoughts around this already and i guess we've never really had this dialogue uh openly like this uh and really thought about it right because <clears throat> i've had an interesting path with spirituality and religion yeah. like i was i grew up in it so strongly in the point that my, my my parents wanted me to be a pastor one day and and go in that direction and i never had any desire to um, and I, and I had a, you know, we, we won't hash out all the things that I, I went through as a child and stuff like that with my father and my mom remarrying and all that. But I saw a lot of hypocrisy <clears throat> as a kid and I saw a lot of dogma. And so when I got older, it really kind of turned me off, uh, religion in general, spirituality in general. Sure. Uh, and I, and I kind of, I wouldn't say that I, I strayed away from my faith or I didn't believe anymore, but it was just like. I was really turned off by a, a lot of uh, of that. It's the human elements, the pageantry of it. You're right for me. Y well, you're right, and that's and I and I that came full circle for me. Now later in <clears throat> in adulthood, this is like getting into my mid to late twenties. What I started to notice in my life that really started to be really interesting to me was when I kind of like had abandoned going to church and thinking about that stuff. It was no longer it, it, it was no longer a thought for me of this is why I do this or not do yeah. this. I, I, I no longer <clears throat> really thought like that anymore. And, but I still had that moral foundation was built because I, I grew up in it. Right. Sure. So uh, I did have the values still in there. And what I started to notice when I wasn't being forced down my throat or choosing to go somewhere and be in this collective group all the time was the more the things that I decided in my life aligned with these values that I learned through these spiritual practices the better my life was. Yeah. Mm. And sometimes that meant sacrifice. Sometimes that meant saying no. Sometimes that meant taking the higher road. Oftentimes Hard, it was. Yeah, many times it was the harder decision. And many times I didn't, you know, and I would make the probably uh, <coughs> more expedient mm -hmm. decision. And what always would happen was shit would happen in my life that didn't go right. But every time that I I made these these decisions based off these values that were ingrained in me, my life enhanced and got better and better. And it was really crazy. And I've gotten older now. And so I've realized that now how valuable that is and and, and how healthy my life has been. The, the, amount, the people that I attract in my life, the people that are in my life mm -hmm. that I surround myself with, 
because I've become closer and closer to this person that has all these values, I now attract other people that are like that, which has also elevated my health mentally, physically, all sure. those things. So for me, it's been a lot about the, the the values that come with somebody who has a lot of these spiritual, because you, you take somebody who grew up like me and then Katrina was very different. They're very, her family is very anti-religion. But then they have a, they have spiritual practices. So that was really a, an interesting, you know, situation for me for someone who grew up in a very structured religious home and spiritual sure. home. And then meeting somebody who had this kind of like free kind of spirituality where it's just like, yeah, you know, no not claiming that this religion or this belief is the way it is. But yes, there's a greater higher power. Yes, we should do good to others and like having those still some sort of a moral fabric. And then realizing like how good of people her she was and her family, it's like, oh wow. So maybe it's less about, you know, the religion or my religion. And it's more about the the moral fabric and values that come from those practices. Yeah, there's two two things that I think about when I talk about that specific topic with that is one, <laughs> how arrogant we are to 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 look at spiritual practices that have existed for thousands and thousands of years. Actually, I mean Recorded human history shows that humans have always had some kind of a spiritual, esoteric type of practice. So how arrogant are we to say, we don't need that? I think we do. I think we do need that. Mm -hmm. And the ideas that have stuck around, morality as it is, that you see lots of common morality in lots of different spiritual practices, lots of common, like different religions, different spiritual practices, and there's some common threads. That's wisdom. That's truth. And those things have stood the test of time, just like evolution, right? So how evolution works is you know, bad things that don't work tend to get thrown out. Good things tend to continue moving forward. Well, this happens with ideas as well. And we're very arrogant to look at things and go, that's dumb. We're smart now. Let's just use reason. Reason is great, but it's super limited because we're so smart that we can reason ourselves to almost anything. Mm -hmm. We can reason almost anything into existence and make excuses and reasons <clears throat> for why we act a particular way, why we take, take advantage. Like, it's far more reasonable... Um, and more natural to look around at people and say, yeah, you're weaker than me. I should have power over you, mm -hmm. you know, and not, we're obviously not all, we all aren't born with equal rights. That doesn't make sense. You're tall, you're short, you're handicapped, you're not. What's a strange belief system that we now take for granted is that, you know, we all have these kind of, we should all be treated a particular way, regardless of how we're born, where we're from or whatever. Now it's not, it's not exercised perfectly. But that's a crazy belief that came from these spiritual practices where there's a lot of wisdom. And then also this like, like you know, life is hard for everybody, okay? It's always going to be challenging for everybody. Um, and I know the argument, oh, some people have it harder than others. I think that that's very general. I think it's hard to look at an individual and say, well, you have it easier than me because you're rich or because you're, because we don't know what's going on. What makes life bearable, obviously, is giving meaning to this challenge. Otherwise, life is unbearable. My God, we would be just seeking out drugs and pleasure and all the time, which we know where that leads. So um, there's value there. And then, again, the argument that I'm making here is for health and fitness people who are data-driven, forget all the stuff I just said. Look at the data. The data is clear. You want to live longer. You want to be healthier. If you're really pursuing health, that's really what you're after, you cannot deny the data. So at the very least, you should be open-minded and say, okay, there's something here. Yeah. Just like exercise, the data is clear. If somebody tries to debate with me against exercise, I'll show them all the you know data and say, look, here's a deal. Try it out. You got nothing to lose. Be open-minded. All the data says so. The same thing is true of spiritual practice. The data is clear. You live longer. You're healthier. You have better immune system. You, you tend to have worse health problems. You have better relationships. People tend to stay married longer and be happier. They had happier children. This is all proven in, in the data. So, you know, it's, it's a part of health. So if we're a health, you know, if we're health influencers or podcasts or celebrities or whoever you are, you're a personal trainer coach, you can't deny that. Hey, what's up, everybody? Thinking about competing in your first powerlifting competition, or do you just want to get stronger in your bench press, deadlift, and squat? We have a program called MAPS Powerlift, and I'm going to give it away for free right now to one of you viewers, but this is how you enter to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel. Turn on notifications. Do all of those things, and then if we like your comment and pick you as the winner, we'll notify you in the comment section, and you'll get free access to MAPS Powerlift. One more thing before we start the show. 
We're running a sale on some other programs. MAPS Starter, which is a introductory strength training program, is 50% off. And then the Prime Bundle, which is Prime Pro and MAPS Prime. This is correctional exercise, mobility focused. This you can combine with any workout program. So it just improves whatever you're doing now by making you move better and be more connected to your movement and reducing things like pain and imbalances. That bundle is 50% off. So MAPS Starter, 50% off. Prime Bundle 50% off. You can find both of them at mapsfitnessproducts.com, but you have to use the code AUGUST50 for the 50% off discount. All right, here comes the show. Clear. To me, it's very similar to when you brought up the, those community studies um, that were kind of comparing relationships and toxic relationships yeah. to packs of cigarettes and versus like creating this community and like what that does for longevity in terms of your lifespan. Uh, and it, the thing about... You know, there, there's turnoffs and things for people with religion, but what what it does provide is a lot of structure there, a lot of purpose, a lot of community, a lot of uh, moral fabric, a lot of like thinking outside of yourself, which is a very important thing that I think these days I don't see a lot of it because everything just is pushed into this narcissistic way yeah. of of voicing my opinion of being me, me 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 and like showing myself off at my best and just it's so self-consuming what are you doing for other people like it, how many times i'm just like that's like the first question i'll ask somebody that's like you know in this sort of state of like depression or, or just like, I'm, I just don't feel like, you know, things are going well. Yeah. Well, look, religious people is a fact. Again, this is data. Religious people are more charitable. It's a fact. They give more time, they give more money and they actually literally help more people. Not that they signal that they help more people. They don't post on their social media that they help more people. They don't get mad and enraged on social. Media. Actually, the data shows they actually do more for others. And it's the religion. It's the spiritual practice that moves you in that direction. And it's not as much as you're obeying words but rather when you no, view it's things a, it's a hack so you're actually touching on something so i actually i was journaling the other night and it's kind of this is weird we're going this direction uh and uh what you guys are talking about is something that i wrote down because it was i was trying to define uh you know just a handful three to five of my truths or if I were to go back and tell my younger self, like, these are some of the biggest hacks in life. Mm. If you can figure this out young, like to get, like, and that was what inspired me to, to start and write things. And I'll, I'll, I'll read you one of them that is to the point you're talking about. And it, it, it's, it's, a, it's actually a, a Bible verse, second Corinthians nine, six through eight. <clears throat> Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly and whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Yeah, so. And that, and you hear that you hear that in a lot of different versions, right? Like you get what you give, the energy you put out, you yeah. come back. Like you hear that in a lot of different versions, don't you? But I mean, that's right. that's something that I've I've lived my my life by, which is yeah. You know, and here's a here's a, a non religious way you've heard it before, which is your your true uh, net worth is your network, you know. And part yeah. of building a large network is 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 doing service for other people and yeah. living a life like that where you don't expect something in return. That's like the secret sauce in a lot of the success that I've had in my life is understanding that and having those values of like, I look for people, one, that I like and want to build a relationship. And I look for ways that, that I could be of service to their life. And that ends up always paying me back. Now, it doesn't always pay me back with that one person. And you have to understand that. That And also you're you, not doing it for the payback. And that's why you have to do it like that. Yeah. Because if you do it like that, then you start counting like, oh, I done that. And I helped this person. They burn me. And it's like, okay, that does happen to me. Let's say 10 times I, I live my life that way where I don't expect anything in return. I genuinely want to give to this person. I want to be of service. And I want to help them. But you know what does happen is that one person out of 10. And that one person completely, radically changes my life, either levels me up in a whole nother way, ends up being a crazy best friend or partners or something else in my life that takes me so much further than those nine other people who did nothing for me. Yeah. And so if you can live your life that way where you look at it like that, you don't expect anything in return, it does pay you back. Well, tenfold. so, you know, people talk about authenticity all the time. Like, oh, be authentic. This is a big thing on social media. You know, Be authentic. Authenticity is... Doing things for, for example, doing things for others for the sake of doing things for others, not for the sake of getting something returned, getting more views, making more sales, having that right. person, you know, oh, I know that person's got connections, so I'm going to do this. And we all know this. We all know those people who act nice to you, but you could tell they want something back. And those people are just 
they just are genuinely good people. They never want anything in return. It's a totally different feeling. Um, and by the way, you know, if you want to talk about, you don't have to, again, you don't have to have the mystical esoteric part. So let's take that out for a second. Yeah. If you look at all these spiritual practices, there are commonalities in a lot of them. And that's one of them. One of them is, you know, what they call it, the golden rule or, you know, and lots mm -hmm. of religions. I think if, if anything, all the popular relig religions and spiritual practices talk about that. What does that tell you? There is a human truth there. There's wisdom there that people have found that never communicated with each other on, on corners of the earth where there wasn't cross breeding of religions and spirits. And yet they figured this out. They figured this out. They figured this out. They all preach this and they say it a little different. But they all say the same thing. Yeah. That's where you find like really interesting truths that humans mm -hmm. have figured out and practiced for thousands and found value in. So here we are, right? Fiber optic cables, internet. I'm so smart. We got all these studies mm -hmm. and arrogance. Wow, oh, the arrogance. Arrogance well, is through the it's roof. It's so crazy. Well, another another one of uh, well, another one of the truths that I I had written down was uh, things don't happen to me; they happen for me. And I think that requires a bit of uh, belief or faith. That reframes the shit out of everything, doesn't it? It does. It, it, nothing ha nothing happens to me. Everything happens for me. And you have to kind of have this faith or belief in a higher higher power guiding that, or whether that be the universe or God or whatever thing, you, you that I believe that this was a gift, even in the most awful circumstances. And it's really fucking tough to actually believe that yeah. like you have to practice that and when you learn to reframe all those situations I, in, at least in my life when i've learned to reframe those situations and you're not like going to be able to do it every time right no. something terrible happens it's almost impossible it could be so hard right or it sometimes what ends up happening is it takes a while you yeah. know initially it hurts so bad it hits you so hard and you go like oh my god how could losing this this child or losing this thing in my life or this being fired from this how could there be a gift here this yeah, kid because yeah, yeah. it's causing all these other rippling effects but i truly believe that it always is there's there's a reason why i needed to leave there mm -hmm. there's a reason why that person's no longer in my life so and then i'm uh, and then i'm on this crazy path to figure it out like what is the yeah. message what am i supposed to learn and that, I mean, that is definitely part of the spiritual practice is learning how to do that. Have you guys seen the movie, uh, The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind? Yeah, great movie. Have I you seen that? No, okay, so Jim it's Jim Carrey, Carrey yeah. but it's a, it's a serious role. It's actually one of the most Very underrated well movies done, I've ever yeah. seen. Mm -hmm. And in it, the premise is that they have this technology where you have like trauma or tough things. You go and they erase it. Mm -hmm. And so he, in the movie, and I'm a spoiler alert, right? In the movie, he meets this girl and they start to have this connection, whatever. Doesn't realize that they had been before had a relationship and they broke up and it was so traumatizing that they had gone and erased their memories of each other. And you end up realizing the value and the pain and the, what they went through before that they erased because they got rid of it because they don't want that pain. It's like this popular procedure. Really, really powerful movie. Yeah. It takes you on such a roller coaster. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, it's really good. I can't believe I've never seen that before. So, it, it, I, you know, I watched it one night because I kept hearing about it. Why is it. it not so popular? Is it because it has kind of like religious under, undertones to it? Because Jim Carrey at the time, I think, was known as being like this funny guy. Yeah, they guy. weren't taking him serious in a serious acting role, I think, yeah. back then. But, uh, yeah, it was like one of those kind of indie films. That just didn't get enough publicity, I think, for yeah. the most part. It was really good. Yeah. Oh, hey, so talking about love and stuff, so check this out. Did you know that uh, giving giving men testosterone or having their testosterones come up to a healthy high level, we all know oh, it's more drive, more confidence, more strength, right, all that stuff. It's also more affection, more hugs, and more love. So there's a study that shows that when men's testosterone levels were- So it's not always toxic. It's not a toxic hormone. It's a hormone that you need for health. And that when men had low testosterone and they brought it up to healthy levels, they were more affectionate with their partners, more loving, know? more. Yeah. I, Why are you laughing? Because <laughs> you know I got something for that. Yeah, too. No, no. <laughs> you think they just want to have sex? Yes. No. Yes, bro. <laughs> My husband's some so hidden good. meaning. Yes, yeah. bro. I mean, I think they have ulterior motives. <laughs> Yeah. No, it's funny, don't. a lot more heavy petting. I mean, yeah. no, this would be <laughs> real hard to tease that out of that study. You know what I'm saying? It's uh, like this was general. This was it was general <laughs> feeling. It was a pretty well made study. Uh, I mean, I I, I appreciate you. He delivery. buys me more flowers now. Yeah. This is so yeah. weird. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, I get more back rubs. He's trying to get laid <laughs> now. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. That testosterone was running through him. He, he didn't care so much. Well, before. no, think about it this way: when you were okay, so all joking aside, when your testosterone was super low. You probably were more more sad, more irritable, totally. more negative. Not wanting to have sex, all those things. Yeah. So then when yeah. it's higher, you feel happier. 
you're more likely to feel confident, which makes you want to. Yeah, be I mean, I think part of why I'm driven. laughing is because yeah. I have personally experienced that, and I and I do agree with that. But what I what I haven't done is unpacked my motives, right? Like, and been really <laughs> been really honest with myself. I mean, let's be let's be let's be completely real here, right? So. When my yeah, libido goes up too, when my happier, yeah. When my testosterone was really, really low, okay, uh, I don't feel good sexually. I don't want it sexually. Like I'm not thinking that way. Therefore, I'm probably not as touchy feely and kissing on my wife and doing those things. When my hormone levels are up, like I, I want to have sex. I feel more. Well, hold on, I got something for you because we worked with you through this process. We saw your testosterone go low and your testosterone go high. Now, unless you want to have sex with Justin and I. Uh, which I don't, maybe, who knows, but Let's I don't think so. Not use it as a clip. You were, I know, you were, uh, you definitely were friendlier and and not like you're a super touchy-feely person anyway. Yeah. But the th- ear rub thing that you do. Yeah. Definitely happened more frequently. Oh, uh, okay. Being happier. Okay. Yeah. Adam mm-hmm. does this thing. Okay, well, he that's, likes, a, that's He a, likes to rub your ears. Yeah. It's really weird. <laughs> It goes all the way. I, it's, I like it now. He goes all the way back to elementary school. But it doesn't school. happen. I'm like, why is he, why is <laughs> yeah. he in my, my ear? Up, dude? Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait. That goes back to elementary school? Yeah, yeah. All the way back to elementary school. I actually had a friend that used to do it. He, I can't take the credit for being the first person to do it. Like he used to, he used to do that. And then I asked, he used to do it to like r- relax me and calm me down when I was younger. Oh, what? Yeah, yeah. You know no what's, way. you know what's really fucking trippy is actually seeing my son do it laying in bed. Shut your face. Yeah, yeah. Was, I don't think I've ever shared that before. Yeah, like, I'll, isn't I'll, that weird? Yeah, you didn't teach him that. No, of course I didn't teach him that. And I. He wow. hasn't even seen me do that. So like, it's not a learned behavior either, but I've seen him soothe himself like laying in bed and just kind of like play with his earlobe like that. No right. way. Yeah, I trip out. That dude. is Totally hilarious. trip out Dude, a- that. Aurelius. Uh, I'm terrible at that. I oh. just punch my friends in the gut. <laughs> you're, so, you're such <laughs> a <laughs> dick. Buddy. You know, you know why? Because you want terrible. you want to touch him so bad, but you, you want to do it in a way that, yeah. Oh, I can't yeah, Someone you. asked me, the, another one of the questions they asked about you guys is who's more likely to give a compliment? I said, oh, Sal, for sure. I said, Justin buries all his feelings. <laughs> <laughs> Good ones, so, bad yeah, ones. All of them. All of them. Like, even if he's like, you know what? Adam's a really nice guy. Bury it. Bury it. Yeah. 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 Bury it. I don't want him to think I'm attracted to him. Bury yeah. it. Yeah. Give, open that door. <laughs> <laughs> you know what, though? But when he gives a compliment, yeah, it's a no, big it's deal. A real like, one. Whoa, bro. And it's not even a big compliment. He's like, you know, it? you're you're an all right guy. Yeah. Ooh, so you're yeah. going to cry right now. <laughs> Justin said something like that. That's <laughs> right. Yeah, he didn't anyway, punch me. So I was going to tell you guys so Aurelius has got this thing now where. He's so cocky. He says no. It's cocky. Dude, he says no, but like he looks at you and he just goes, no. no. So I'll tell you what happened. So Jessica, she's, she's, she's has to, she has to go to the bathroom. Are you ready to argue? She has to go to the bathroom. So she leaves the door open because he's playing and they're by the front door. So if you go in my house, there's a bathroom as soon as you walk in to the right. So she goes, she's you know about to go to the bathroom and he goes to open the front door. So the front door opens out, obviously the front yard. And she goes, Aurelius, I'm going to go to the bathroom. You can't do that. And he goes, no. And then he starts to crank on the door. Really, I'm going to the bathroom. Don't do that. And he goes, and then we filmed him saying this no, because it's such a shitty. And he goes, no. And he opens the door. So now he's looking outside, and then he makes this this car noise when he sees cars pull up. So he goes, broom, broom. So he's looking outside, and he goes, and he goes, broom, broom. And she goes, oh, shit. It's the it's like UPS or Amazon, right? She's like, really, close the door. I'm going to the bathroom. No. And then he looks and he goes, hi, hi. And the Amazon lady walks up. Jessica's like, <laughs> <laughs> the door's open. <laughs> and she brings the package in, like looking around. She's like, please put it down. I'm in the bathroom. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> it's so hilarious. Oh, Little yeah, turkey. Yeah, he does yeah. that. He, we have to be careful now because he'll he'll just open the front door and walk out. <laughs> and go wow. hang out. You know what I just yeah. did? I uh, just introduced Max to the uh, Paleo Valley beef sticks. He loved them. Oh, it really? He likes those too. Oh, yeah, yeah. He I does. just. And I just introduced him to him. We were driving somewhere and I had him, I had him in the truck and he was asking him hungry. You know, his thing is, uh, tummy hurts. Tummy hurts. That's when he's hungry. That's what he says. Tummy when hurts. When he's hungry? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah tummy hurts, you know? <laughs> all right, all right. We'll get you some food. Kid eats all day long, like nonstop. But uh, I wasn't sure if he was going to like it. He loved it. So, yeah. 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 Aurelius likes, all my kids like the beef sticks, which is cool because uh, especially for my daughter, it's hard to give her adequate protein. She's not like a protein person. Mm-hmm. But she likes the meat sticks, so I'm like, here. You go. I think it's like six or seven grams. Of well, protein. it's such it's, a. It's okay, it goes back to the. Snack, it goes back to the conversation I was telling you guys about the whole percentage of protein. It's a. It's an actually true protein snack, and it's yeah. so hard yeah, to find yeah. a quote unquote protein snack right. because mo- you have to normally go get a thing of meat in order to get well, something high, a good amount of calories. That's also find me other uh, like other convenient protein snacks. 
Yeah, you know, they're nothing. hard. Jerky yeah. is one of them, but jerky's dry as hell. Boiled eggs. And kids yeah. never like jerky because it's super dry. The meat sticks are like, I think that's why my kids like it because they're not dry. Yeah. You, yeah. you know, they're, they're, you know, I hate to use the word moist, but they are. They're not, they're not <laughs> they're dry. moist. I know. Yeah. Nobody likes that word. Yeah. Also, you know what else I introduced them to? Not that I'm going to do this regularly, but I thought it would be funny. We were in, uh, I think we were Willow Glen and we ate some, uh, some early dinner. <clears throat> and there's this new little, candy store and I, you guys, I love candy stores I just I don't know what it is about them I like walking through them so I'm like oh shit there's new candy store let's go in there so we take him through and of course he want, he's looking at all the colors and he wants to try stuff and I saw Pop Rocks uh, do you guys yeah. remember Pop Rocks? Yes. You give them Pop I'm Rocks? I'm giving them to my kids, dude, just to watch them. <laughs> yes. Yes. I'm like, did you sit there just like anticipating <laughs> yes, like dude. what was going to happen? So I'm yeah. like, this is going to be great. And I gave it to him and he just loved it. He oh, sticks really? his tongue out. Uh, like, and he's like, more? I'm like, okay. So he was <laughs> popping everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I took a video of it, so we'll, we'll put that up. Uh, it's a good, good time, dude. Uh, he dude. enjoys it. Right now, we're going through the, I'm the, the swimming phase right now. I'm trying to get him to kind of break free. Like, first of all, it took forever to get Max to get in a cold pool. He got so used to like spas, warm baths, mm. and he like just the cold, a cold pool, he would just yeah. f- freak out. Didn't want nothing to do with it. So almost all of last year, I could hardly ever get him into the pool. He's finally got to the place where, and I think it was just being around a bunch of other kids and playing in the pool. Haven't you noticed that when they're around other kids are way more likely to try new shit? Yes. Totally. I mean, I, I think that has a huge, I think that's the main reason because he's seen all these other kids that are close to his age that are jumping in the pool and doing all that stuff like that. Mm-hmm. I still can't, he doesn't want anything to do with like, you know, all the cool life fest water wing things that they have yeah. so he can get in there. He still wants to be attached to me. Well, yeah, bro. Mm-hmm. Have you seen the video that he did? He hangs onto your back and you swim around. It's that's cool. like the most fun uh, thing yeah, ever for is. a kid. Yeah. Well, and selfishly for me too, I like it. Cause I he's, he's he literally holds on to you like you're, I, a, and like I you're can, a boat. Bro, and I can I can freestyle swim. I can jump left, right, and, and like he just hangs on. Yeah, he clings. <laughs> he wraps me. Of right, course, he's like not gonna want a life vest. Dude. Yeah, he wrap yeah. he wraps me with his his legs really well, and he holds on with his hands, and he'll he'll put both hands up, and then he's still hooked with my legs, and like it's pretty funny how he oh, does it. Oh, that's so funny. So yeah, selfishly, I'm like, Danny yeah, if he doesn't, yeah, yeah, if he doesn't break Ooh, free, yeah, 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 I'm okay with. Well, that's well, see, so no, it's it's true when kids see other kids. So same thing. We were we were again Willow Glen and my son likes to hold my hand when he goes ups and down the stairs unless he's crawling up or but when he's trying to step down and there were little kids that were his age and they were going up and down sure enough he goes to try it and he does it and he gives himself an applause which is hilarious <laughs> but <laughs> I'm like good job Jessica's like he's your son yeah, he yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude, yeah. He's, I'm good right now awesome. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. good Did job buddy that? Yeah. but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I talked to the, one of the dads because he had a son that was the same age as Aurelius and I said, man, your kid's like going up and down these stairs and jumping down. And he goes, oh, he's got an older sister. I'm like, oh, that's true. When little ones have an oh, older yeah. sibling, yeah, yeah. They, 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 they have to quickly. They have yeah, to pick up that. Because they see yeah, their, their older brother. It was funny to talking about you know, my son as well. Like he, uh, he, he just, he's been doing uh, piano and learning from my, my mom, like all this like piano songs and he's really getting into it. And you could tell that like, you know, the musical side starting to kind of come in with him. Like, I'm like, Oh, interesting. Is this Ethan or Everett? Is Everett. Yeah. Yeah. And so he, he was asking her about, cause I took <coughs> piano and everything when I was a kid and all this stuff. And, and so they're talking about it. And so my mom actually like pulled out another video. Like she's my mom, is like really good at, at capturing everything. Like, so these all like VHS and like pictures. She has like albums for like everything, you know, that's awesome, like, bro. Which, which is great. Like, and it's like, we're, we're terrible at that me and Courtney have mm. like, you know, like stopped kind of filming the kids doing things and like capturing all these moments. But it's just, I forget that sometimes. And she's like, oh yeah. So I have this video of like my first piano performance and it was like Moonlight Sonata, which is like this, you know, this, this great song, I don't know, Beethoven or whoever, but it was like a watered down version of it. So it was like a little easier because I was just like, I think it was like nine years old or something. No. Yeah. And so I'm playing it and I'm, and I'm getting all into it. Like, cause I really get into music, but like back then when I was a kid, I didn't have any sort of like social cues or feet, like filters in terms of like, you know, like I just started like really getting into it, like <laughs> rocking my body. And, was you this know, a recital? Yeah, it was a recital. I'm playing for all these people and I get to the point where it's towards the end and I'm just like trying to play it softer and I'm playing it softer and then I'm like hunching them all the way down on the, like this. <laughs> oh, no. I want to see this. Yeah, and then, and then it like cuts, you know, and everybody's like on pins and needles and they're like, 
Yeah. You know, like done, but it was just so. It was How so old over dramatic, he, dude. He said like seven, right? Or no, nine. It was like probably like nine, eight or nine. Yeah. Oh, young. Like that. Oh. But yeah, it was pretty hilarious to watch. I did one piano solo uh, uh, recital and I played it was Hot Cross Buns. You know, that's the song everybody learns. At uh -huh. first. Yeah. And I just, you could tell. If you, I don't know if I'll ever be able to find this video, but I remember watching it because my mom showed me like 10 years ago <clears throat> and I'd like, I'm tripping on the way in, trying to step over something, and then I and I just I'm not a music person. <laughs> now, you, you you mentioned that you and Courtney are really bad about kind of documenting everything with the kids, like at this point, like. And what about you, Sal? With you and Jessica, are you, excellent. She's really good. She's super good, and you're not so good. No, so I'll take a lot of pictures, but I never organize them. I just don't. I have my phone's got bazillion pictures, Facebook, right. but she'll she's very good, and she'll go on my phone, or she'll tell me, send me all the pictures you took just now, right away. I send them to her. And she actually takes the time to organize them into digital albums. And then what she did oh, wow. recently is she printed uh, albums. So we have 2017, 2018, 2019. I think we have 2020. And they're albums of like, you know, good, like pictures that are meaningful throughout the year of just her and I, us with the kids, whatever. So we, and so she does a great job. I would, I'm terrible. I would never, it would get lost in the yeah, mix. Yeah, I'd yeah. never look at them again. That's awesome to have that. I think. Do I'm, you guys do that? Yeah. I'm, I'm actually the one who does that. I wish I wasn't, but <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of work. It is. It is a lot of work. Cause it it's, takes her hours. It's a lot of work. And I do all of it. Like I do all the, the photo taking, the videoing, the organizing of it, the building maxes like page, like I separate them over, but I separate them by year also. Yeah. So they're, they're all in chronological order and I have different albums for each one. So have like, you tried printing them yet? So I've made books. So I, so what I do is I go to Shutterfly and I actually create albums in Shutterfly. Yeah. Yeah. And then we, we, we print. That's like, what she does. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I so like. So you have those. Yeah. Yeah. I've done it for Katrina and I's relationships for, since we started. I used to be really good at the beginning. So romantic. I, I used to, <laughs> I used to, yeah, that's a romantic. It is very romantic. Yeah. It's actually out of necessity. Cause I think I really appreciate that stuff. Uh, I, I actually, in, until Katrina, I would never did that in my relationship. So I wasn't the guy who I, but I've had, I've been in relationships with girls that do that. And I really appreciate it because I come from a family that didn't have a lot of stuff. There's not a lot of video of me as a kid or a lot of photos. Like my mom has minimal stuff that I could look back at. And the same thing goes for like my dad. Like I have very little stuff of my real dad that I wish that I could go back, watch or look yeah. at and stuff like that. And I really don't. So I've always liked that stuff because I want that for my son or my kids, yeah. like to be able to go back and like look at albums or watch videos. So I make an effort to do it. You know what I hate, dude? Work. I, I've said this before, but Facebook <clears throat> will be like eight years ago today, and it's a picture of my kids. Messes yeah. me up for a good thirty minutes. Oh yeah, every time. I just saw one the other day. I was at Disneyland. My son and my daughter. She must have been three, so he was seven. And they're just standing there all cute and little. And now, you know, he's 17. She's going to turn 13. And I'm just like, oh, turn the page. Oh, yeah. I, can't, I can't do it. Yep. It's just, uh, it gets a little hard. Anyway, uh, I just watched the new Predator. Have you guys seen this? What? Yeah. So, huh? is, I mean, is it on Amazon? Like, where do you Hulu. find it? Oh, Hulu. Okay. That's like, for real? Like, yet. real? Or is it like some knockoff version? Is it like No, no, no. It's Predator. It's called Prey. Is it a movie? It's a movie. It's a movie. Okay. Okay, so. Prequel? No, it's just in the in that universe, right? In the in the whole universe of Predator, right? Because you have the original Predator, you have, yeah. and Predator Two, then, then you have alien, Predator, alien Predator, Predator, then you have Predators, yeah. Which so, is, and some yeah. of them are cheesy, some of them are great. Obviously, the original is the best. The one with Arnold, there's like none of them come close to that. Yeah. This one takes place in it's probably, if I had to guess, uh, 1700s. In North America. Oh, I did see. Okay, I saw a trailer for this, and it was like, yeah, you had uh, the Wild West kind of settlers and all that. It was or Cherokee, or Cherokee. Yeah, okay. so so there it is, right there. So it would be it would be technically prequel because Arnold, I guess technically Arnold, Arnold time is Predator One. Yes, technically, right? Yes. But it doesn't. It's not. It, there's nothing that really harks. To, oh, like so it doesn't tie in at all. No, or, it's uh, just it's just the story is if you're and I'm a huge Predator fan. Uh, when I was a kid, that original one I must have watched at least yeah. fifty times, right? So that, it's just like this in a different setting. Yeah, now. the whole story yeah. is right that Predator. The, the, it's the species of alien, and their favorite thing to do is hunt. And what they do is they go to other planets, and they're always looking for the hardest, most challenging prey to hunt. Um, and that's why in the, I think it was Predator 2, the one with Danny Glover, mm -hmm. where they go, he goes on the ship and then you see the alien skull in the background and that's yeah. why they connected him because obviously they hunted, you know, the alien monsters or whatever. But anyway, in this one, it's Cherokee and this, and the Predator looks different. 
He's got a different like mask on, almost like they're a little bit more primitive because uh -huh. maybe it's before. Yeah. So their technology is even slightly more primitive. Oh, interesting. Um, but it was it was pretty cool. It, you know, part of, parts of it I don't like. Like you know, it's just this petite. Cherokee chick and she's like a ninja. You know, like she's fighting this predator. I'm like, dude, he literally slaughtered 15 men with muskets and yeah. you have a hatchet and you're just like yeah. kicking his ass. Like that kind of stuff. I'm like, come on, let's make it more. <laughs> but I like the 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 predator. I like the 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 way he looked. It looked different than the original one. So you could tell oh, that the species is a little different. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I'll but if you're out. not a hardcore fan, I don't know if it's I mean, good. I liked it. I liked even some of the cheesy ones. I watched yeah. I mean, I definitely you watched You guys will you'll like it then. I watched Predator 1, Predator 2. I, I I actually was one of the probably few people that liked the Alien versus Predator because I liked Oh, the, I liked it. Yeah. yeah, I liked it. I thought it was cool. You know? I think the hunting But you have to go into it with yet like knowing there's yes. going to be the little cheesy elements. I like the it. hunting weapons that he that they use. Like the, remember yeah. the one where the net flies on you, but mm -hmm. then it shrinks and it like yeah, it slices you up. up on you. Yeah. There was that one, and then you know, you know how he has that aiming device? It's like three laser yeah. points. Yeah. In this one, he shoots like these these like darts that go through uh, people like instead of the darts laser or something. Okay. Yeah, and I, it's almost like his. They will only use technology that makes the it challenging. They won't go like he could obviously slaughter everybody. If is, he it to. is it yeah. always the same writer? Is the same writer wrote all of them? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah, because I feel like they're so different that some, sometimes I feel like maybe it's like different people picked it up and were writing it, or yeah. has it been consistent? Find I, that out, Doug. I, I seriously doubt it. Yeah. You doubt it's the same person? I, I doubt it's Dude, the same person. Dude, do you know yeah. the, the camouflage technology okay. that they showed in the first Predator? Which, when was the first Predator made? Was that 89? I think yeah, it Yeah, they been, figured that out. It's with, a good guess. Um, th that's real. Yeah. That's sci-fi, yeah. and that's when that's when science starts to follow sci-fi. 87. 87. That 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 camouflage they where it's have almost cameras like cameras behind you, right? And yes. then they can project it in front of you, which then creates the solution. They now of, have technology like that. Yeah. Literally off the like based off what the predator did. That's wild. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Think <laughs> about the imagination. Speaking of like predicting some of that, did you finish listening to the Babylon B uh CEO interview with I'm Joe? I'm like a, an so hour good. left. So yeah. good. Are you listening to it, Joe? I'm like forty five minutes in. Oh, okay. So I've listened to almost all of it. And there's a I don't know if you guys got to this part yet, but he actually brought up to Joe there's twenty Oh. Uh, li I think it's 20 predictions no, that they, they made memes about. 76. That, oh, 76? 76. Oh, that was 20. I just listened to that part, yeah. Oh, so 76 things they predicted like through like joking memes that, that came happened. true. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> yeah you know, like slightly true or like, you yeah, know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some of them close, are like, but some are like dead on and like, you know, some of those things with like Gavin Newsom being like the, the top salesperson for U-Haul, you know, that thing. <laughs> like he did, he did like a, like a couple months uh, before, like it was was released that like um, you all was... said like yeah we, we ran out of trucks like like they're all going to texas <laughs> yeah and so things like that yeah. where it was like it was pretty funny that they've nailed spot on culture before. I... really good conversation around abortion between the two of them well it was civil <laughs> That's what they I mean disagreed, by really, yeah, and they were civil. That's why I was really. That's yeah. actually what got me to listen to the yeah. interview. I mean, yeah. I, I'm already curious and interested about the Babylon B guy uh, already. So I probably might have tuned in a little bit, but for sure what got me was the clip of- You know what makes uh, Rogan so good is that um, he can uh, he can have a different opinion from you, but he's curious and he'll still, yeah. if you're logical, he'll he'll say, okay, well, that makes sense. He'll still listen. Yeah. yeah. And and I think too, like to, you know, it, which was weird. It was a little misleading because some of the cut that brought me into that uh, interview was, it, it, it seemed like it was a little more emotionally charged and, yeah. and driven. But like when you actually listen to them talk it through, there might have been like a little bit of like, well, what about, you know, yeah. but it, it was really evenly composed. Like both were just kind of, um, you know, calm about how they're delivering their point of view. I thought the Babylon B guy crushed it because I thought that Joe came off a little bit aggressive. Like yeah. I actually didn't like he the way- He was deliberately trying to challenge him. He I was feel. like, you know, even like, okay, so I actually, because I, I, I haven't seen that many, you've seen more Joe Rogans. But I have never seen him like right out the gates puffing on a cigar and blowing the smoke and stuff like that. And I thought he kind of had this edge, like he knew he was going to go after him on some things that he knew that they wouldn't agree on. Mm. I felt that. At least I thought I felt that energy from the. the I'm sure he plans stuff like that, right? Oh like, yeah, yeah. But you bring somebody on, and you're like, okay, I need to like kind of challenge some of these ideas. Yeah. I appreciated the whole conversation so far, from what I've heard. No, it, it, didn't was, sound it was good. Like, but it I thought sound... Joe, I thought Joe, like Joe was like getting louder and louder and kept saying like, "You're gonna, you're not gonna tell my 14 year old." Like yeah. he was getting aggressive. Or the, he he was kind of like, well, no, I'm not saying that. I'm this, yeah. you know, this is, uh, you know, I don't think that 
one murder definitely makes a a rape right. You right, know? right so right. like so he exp I thought he kept his calm really well and explained his. I like and then it. afterwards they kind of came full circle I, together. I like it. I like I like it when people can di discuss something that they disagree on. Continue to disagree. Mm -hmm. You don't have to agree, but also uh, you know it's civil and yeah. it's good and we're making points and I can see your side and you can see my side. Okay, that's it. Versus this like shouting. Well, that's or how we can others. all live together. Yeah, <laughs> you know. Yeah. Otherwise, this whole thing of like, oh no, like we just got to get rid of that kind of talk completely and push these people away. Like, how are we ever going to live that's, with each that, other? That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Hey, I pulled up some really uh, amazing studies on an, a, a supplement called Rhodiola, which you guys, I've talked to you guys uh, yeah. before about Rhodiola. It's in the Organifi Red Juice. It's one of the main ingredients in that. There was a lot of Soviet studies on rhodiola. So the Soviets heavily invested in studying rhodiola, and they found tremendous benefits, improvements in speed and strength for track and field, swimming, speed skating, uh, ski racing, weightlifters, wrestlers, gymnasts, triathletes, uh, better, for, it's, uh, better for stamina um, and strength output. And the studies are phenomenal. And then I followed up with studies um, that were done here in the States that kind of mirrored it. It's a really interesting compound. It's one of the few ancient, I what, guess, herbs they that has lots so of data behind strength, it. Strength, stamina, not just uh, endurance. Then, huh? was, it ro was it rhodiola, one of the ones they were they were considering banning from the Olympics? I thought there was a mushroom that they were- they No, were, uh, there was cord so cordyceps. The, there's right? cordyceps, uh, rhodiola, ectisterone. The one that's banned is ectisterone or will be banned. Yeah. Um, but rhodiola has got, uh, like clinically proven mental and physical performance enhancing benefits where you can see like statistically there's a difference. Yeah. And the Soviets, again, um, you know, remember this was state sponsored athletics and during the cold war, it was like, you know, whoever does better is superior. So the Soviets spent a lot of money on researching some of the stuff and rhodiola has been an, <coughs> yeah. an ancient, you know, practice for a long time. So they spent a lot of money on it. And the studies, I mean, it's it for sure, it for sure has an effect. Now, I've used rhodiola. Um, I use the red juice to get off caffeine, and I notice a significant difference. When I go off caffeine without it, uh, it does not feel great. When I do use that, wow, does it take the edge off considerably. Yeah, I was looking into this because I, I had thought, and I'm, I guess I'm wrong with this, but like there was, um, you know, Olympic, there's an Olympic team that was like using beetroot powder, and then that somehow was like targeted, and then they became like one of those substances that they weren't going to allow. But I don't, I don't think that's true, but I know that there's been a lot of like buzz around beetroot powder as well in that direction. Endurance. Yeah. yeah nitric oxide. Oxide, uh, yeah. boosts nitric oxide and endurance. That's another one. Um, it's hard though to find something that does both uh, mental, physical performance, and then in physical performance, strength and endurance. Usually it's one or the other. Um, and rhodiola shows both. So it's just across the board improvements in performance. Oh, and mental performance. So cognitive tests, <laughs> fatigue, that kind of stuff. So they'll fatigue people, have them take a cognitive test, fatigue another group, give them rhodiola and they do much better. So it's like, it, it basically, you know, they consider it an adaptogen, but it basically makes your body more resilient. That's the term that they use in these uh, in these studies. I mean, I feel good when I take it. It's And it's how I use it. I always use it. When There's a right dose though. It's uh, it, you, you, like, I notice for me, if I take too much, I don't feel good. Make you sleepy. Yes. So I have to I've take like that. a, I take a low dose. Now I know other people who could take a higher dose and feel better. So just, you know, caveat, if you use it, uh, start low, see how it affects you oh, before interesting. you jump on it. I know we're in science right now, but I want to transition over into the economy because uh, Doug sent me over some stuff on real estate last night um, about the Bay Area market, which I'd been following already and, and, and see it's coming, right? As far as the reduction in prices. And then I also saw, and I didn't think that this could happen already. I thought this was something that they were going to vote on. Did I hear that that Biden signed the 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 tax reduction act or whatever like that? And is that going through tax reduction act? Yeah, or the, the inflation. Oh, that's excuse me, inflation yeah, because reduction. Because I don't think it's going to reduce. <laughs> well, no, but they're presenting it like the it's opposite. a tax reduction too, right? I mean, they're uh, the, but the inflation reduction act. tax the tax enforcement. No, no, you ready for this? Taxes across the board are going up, except for super wealthy individuals, yeah, according course. to the Inflation Reduction Act. Lots yes. of wealthy individuals. Yeah, it's going to crush taxed. the middle class. We Isn't know it this. ridiculous? I saw, we talked about that with the whole IRS thing. 80, 80, you know, was so it? misleading, dude. Well, All did you? Time. Okay, so so check this out. You want to talk about like, uh, it makes me wonder if, because these lobbies, there's these big lobbies that work with government. We know this is not a secret. So they have an electric car um, subsidy. So electric cars, if you qualify and you go buy an electric car, <clears throat> 
you'll get $7,500 for the government or not you, but the electric car company. So that way they could make it cheaper and more affordable. Did you see what Ford and GM did? Raised it up. Raised the prices <laughs> of their electric cars by guess how much? Exactly. $7,500. $7, <laughs> You know what's lame Look too is that, that the sweet spot you have to be in, like the the car has to be under eighty thousand, under eighty thousand, and you have to make under a hundred, something think. like that. Yeah, yeah. But it's interesting. I wonder if GM and because those are powerful lobbies, right? Powerful American companies. They I wonder if they behind the yeah behind For the scenes. Sure. They're like, do that. We'll raise the price. It'll all be good. You know, we'll get more taxpayer money, whatever. Well, I mean, here's the thing. Okay. And I was going to bring this up as like a speculative discussion because like uh, we actually like had a bit of an issue with like the IRS was like, no, you guys need to pay still like based off of taxes that we had paid and this and that. And there was some discussion there, but like they finally came back months later and like, oh, we were wrong. You did pay that. Right. And so now we're getting all these uh, IRS potentially like new agents that are coming in that are going to be strapped, have guns. Oh. Right? Like what's going to happen when they're bro, wrong that, that, that and is, you're contesting it and, you know, now they're, <laughs> bro, they're that's not That's strapped. not like a conspiracy. That's that's what's happening. That's part of the, in the budget. So there it's I told you guys the other day that it was what, 80 billion or something like that, what they're increasing it to, which is like 10 times. Yeah, almost almost 10 xing it. And one of the main yeah, missions- but what's what's the motivation with them to have guns? Well, well, it's because that what they say is that that that, that there's uh, a lot of people who don't want to pay taxes. There's gonna be there's gonna be a lot of resistance. There's yeah. this, oh. you know, this faction, this extremist mm. faction that believes that taxes are theft. Uh, which technically, you know, if we want to be technical, it is. Listen, they're not they're not wrong on that part. I've shared the story with you guys off air. I think of my you know my experience as a kid. You know how I learned about re car repos. You know was yeah. you know someone coming to repo the car from my dad. And him oh. standing on the back porch with a shotgun, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like, you're not taking our car. Like, so and there's obviously a, a potential. Th and yeah. if you're coming to collect on somebody who owes $50,000 yeah. to the IRS or whatever it be, and they don't have that kind of money, I could see that happen. So I get that. Although that it's a slippery slope, right? Are you, you start, kidding me? You give, we have police now, for what that. what if they're wrong and they take all you know, your assets and then they find out months later, but like you've had to, you know, go through hell, you know, to, to, to fight them. Well, here's the way, this is the way I look at it. First of all, we have police. Okay. We have police. So what they could do is they could work with local law enforcement, which they've done in the past and collect. The, the difference is this is a federal agency that's armed to yeah. collect. Yes. Means that they overstep any local police. Well, the difference which means that IRS can come in and don't have to contact a local police. The difference is that, and what I'm, I'm, I'm most worried about for, for just us in general, like society, right? Is that you, if you almost 10 X the IRS, what is that? What, how much does that increase your odds as just the average Jane or Joe to get audited? Tons. Like, I think that just means that, the, the, and the reason why they need that and the reason why they can't get the support from police is because I think that is going to be a ridiculous increase. Like we're going to see a lot of that. Oh, I think they're yeah. going to go after things like PayPal, Venmo, tips, <clears throat> people getting tips. Um, they're going to go after crypto. Crypto, for sure. Yeah. So what does that say there, Doug? Well, they've always had the criminal investigation division, which sure. has carried guns. So I don't know if this is just expanding that part it or is. if it's going to be general. It's dramatically agents. expanding that yeah. part. That's what, yeah, that's yeah. what's happening. So that's so that none of that is like, you know, conspiracy theory. I mean, that's happening. They, they you all of a sudden throw eighty billion dollars. Yeah, I'm not worried it's gonna get like we're gonna get, you know, people are gonna show up and throw us in gulags. But, go back but to I think I, that they're gonna go after like regular people. Of that's course all they are. they're not going after billionaires. There's seven hundred billionaires in the US. They they got eighty thousand new IRS employees. It ain't for the billionaires. No. It's for everyday. It's for small businesses and for people making cash and you know doing online businesses. That's yeah, who are after. much easier to trip up than somebody who's making billions of dollars has multiple lawyers, C CPAs, yeah. lawyers. The accounts. irony for me of like increasing the amount of enforcement with guns from the party that doesn't want anybody to have guns. <laughs> Only oh well. it just it just like my brain hurts. <laughs> So go back to my original question. So did can you look this up? Did Biden sign that? I thought I saw. I believe it was signed. Yes. Yeah. So is is that official? Do we just did we just infuse another six hundred billion dollars into the economy? Uh, but that reduces the infl inflation. Shut the it? fuck up, bro. Yeah. <laughs> it's like putting a fire out with gasoline. Yeah. Hey, hey, you got to do fire we're extinguishers. Dump this big old thing of gasoline and put this fire out. Let's see. Check how out our new fire extinguishers full of gunpowder. <laughs> <laughs> 
oh my god don't worry you had enough I mean, and eventually puts it out i mean that that scares the shit out of me and that of like trying to figure out what's gonna so i mean doug sent me over the the housing thing oh the bay area is starting to reduce prices yada 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 on stuff like that okay but if we all said now shoot another six hundred billion dollars in the economy, dude, you don't know, be surprised if it goes back speaking up. Speaking of taxes, did you guys know what marijuana dispensaries are doing? It, that I just figured, I just learned this. Maybe you already know this because you know how. Okay, so you know this because you were in the business. If you own a medical marijuana or even recreational marijuana state legal business, it's very hard to do banking. It's very hard to oh, deposit yeah. your money, put it anywhere. When I was in it, you couldn't do it. Right. And my partners, part of their their big vision was actually to open a bank that actually supplied- Would take that money. Yes. But the federal government makes it very challenging very or almost different. impossible. Very so these marijuana growers have to do illegal things to get this money to pay taxes on it. They actually have to find ways to pay taxes on it. So it yeah. becomes, anyway, check out this brilliant, brilliant method that they're totally going to crack down on. You go to this recreational marijuana place, you take your credit card, you convert it to crypto, you take the crypto, you buy the marijuana, they immediately convert that crypto back to cash. Now it's just, they just took crypto. You just, they just took crypto, turned to cash, pay taxes on it. Uh. And literally, he says it happens on the spot. Literally on the spot. How much you want to buy? Oh, $100. Boom. Ethereum. Boom. Cash. Here we go. Pretty smart. I'm telling you right now that that's like the number one way that and why cryptocurrency is being held up right now is from things like that. It's from black market and that. Hmm. Shit like that. It's, it is it it is completely- Well, they're going to go after it for sure. I, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. I think I, I actually think that- I know we, you know, we're talking about how it's going to fuck the middle class, which I think it's going to for sure too. But I think their main motivation is to go after all the crypto money. I, it's going to be it's crypto, Venmo, PayPal, um, all those. I mean, think dude, about easy come, easy go. Yeah, Apple Pay, sending people money. You know, they don't track any of that. So it's basically like it's a digital way of because cash, cash has always been a problem. But it's hard to track cash. Uh, but digitally, I mean, mm -hmm. if they have enough people, technically, they could go in. Yeah, they don't have a firm those. grasp on it yet, but it makes sense that they would start targeting it. You know, specifically. I mean, look at how many people you. I mean, you, everybody has a friend or somebody who made a bunch of money in crypto in the last two or three yeah. years, and so, and I don't know a lot of those people talking about how they're how they're going to pay the taxes on that. No, unless no. if you if you don't declare it, they're they're yet they will, but yet they don't know way of them knowing. They can't. They can't go to these wallets or these companies and say who made money because they <coughs> well, say you know, we don't this, know. You know, this anonymous. is what made me switch sides of the calendar in the marijuana industry, right? So originally, I started as as an operator, right, as somebody who ran one of the clubs. And when I saw the way the tax laws were written for the farmer, I was like, "What am I doing?" Like, so uh, this is how it used. To, this is how it used to work, right? It, the laws have progressed, but this is what originally made me jump to the farming side. Was okay. Farmer comes in. I don't know who he is. First time he's ever meeting me. He has, you know, five pounds of marijuana. At that time, like the going rate, let's just say, was like $3,000 $3, a pound, right? So like $15,000 worth of marijuana he walks in with. And I look at it and go, okay, this is this works. I like it, whatever. I agree to it. I I, I will pay him the $15,000. Yeah. I am responsible on my end for tracking that transaction, paying that. He is protected by another law of his for farmers. for farmers and his identity that he does not have to give me any of his stuff. So then it is on up to so him. So he didn't have to jump through a bunch of hoops and break laws he, to make that. He, he It's up to him to decide if he's going to claim that. And I'm always dealing in cash in the marijuana business. It's always cash. So I'm handing him $15,000 in cash. I have to log it in my books, pay my taxes on what's going on, right? He doesn't. He doesn't have to do any of that. He, he's supposed to, on his end, claim any sort of cash or income that he gets. But, I mean, there's nothing that tracks or tra is traced back to him. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm on the wrong, could he also, I'm on the wrong side of this counter. Could he also technically mm. be like, I sold corn, I sold, and they wouldn't know, and then he'll pay taxes on it? Type or, of deal, sure. Yeah, sure. Wow. Yeah, or nothing at all. Isn't that funny? Say I didn't. I don't have it. I the mean, federal government nobody's, literally nobody's is, tracking his trees and pounds of weed that come from like. No how one funny it. is that? The federal government literally is creating black markets. Yes, and more and more black markets. Mm -hmm. It's so wild. I mean, that's what. So what happened again? What made me leave the clubs? Too another part of that equation was. There and we all used to meet, right? So the, I was there when it was. We were one of the first four, and then there was like ten. And there was we had and we collect, we created a group called MC Thirteen, which was the original thirteen you know, marijuana clubs, and we'd all get together and try and fight the you know the city on things like that. And quickly, it became very competitive 
with pricing and stuff like that. And I remember you guys know me, like I'm, I'm like, I'm always doing the numbers and it's like, this doesn't mathematically make sense. There's no way these guys are selling this with, I, I know all the way that the, you're going to pay taxes. Oh, yeah. I know it is not making sense. And then when I find out, it's like, Oh, because everybody's doing backdoor deals. Yeah. Everybody's doing illegal stuff or taking stuff off the books or selling something. And if else. you want to do it legally, they won't let you. Yeah. And so then you either got to play the same game as them doing illegal stuff in order to compete and stay, keep your doors open, or you try and be legit and you end up getting crushed because you can't afford yeah. to stay, to stay in the market. And so it was like the writing was on the wall for me really early. Like I got to get out of this like I go, or go to another side. And at that point it was like, oh, the farming side, that's uh -huh. where it's at. The farming side, it's still so gray right now. I can go be a producer for all these people. And then it's up to me to claim how much that I'm making right. off of doing all that stuff. Wow. Yeah, mm -hmm. wild. Hey, check this out. Look, you're into health and fitness, but you also like to enjoy yourself sometimes with the occasional alcoholic beverage. The only problem is it makes people feel bad sometimes, physically makes them feel bad. Well, check out this company we work with called Zbiotics. This is a probiotic drink that is genetically modified, so you'll never find this anywhere else. This is patented to break down acetaldehyde in the gut. What's that? Some of the negative byproducts of alcohol. So when you when it, when you drink alcohol, acetaldehyde gets produced. Your liver breaks down pretty much most of it, but some of it ends up in your gut, goes in your bloodstream, wreaks havoc. Okay, Zbiotics takes care of that. It's remarkable. Drink this, then go drink some alcohol, and notice how you feel the next day. It's pretty awesome stuff. Go check them out. Head over to zbiotics.com. That's Z-B-I-O-T-I-C-S.com forward slash mind pump. And then use code mind pump 22 for 10% for off your first order. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Olivia A. Pretty. Hanging leg raises have been very difficult for me. What kind of progression plan would you suggest to be able to do them with ease? Okay, so- A reg Regression is the what we're looking yeah, for. Yeah, regression. So, mm -hmm. um, so the- the short answer is reverse crunches. That's the best exercise that'll lead to hanging leg raises. But the point I want to make with this is that hanging leg raises are one of the most challenging exercises for the core, for the abs to do properly. A lot of people do hanging leg raises. Very few people do it properly. What yeah. a lot of people do are what are called hip flexor raises, where they're just bending at the hips and bringing the legs up. I see people do this all the time at the gym. I work out in the morning and I see middle-aged people who have no business, you know, getting on and hanging on the, the straps or holding on to the one that supports their arms. And have we they programmed them? Just hanging leg raises are in uh, No BS six-pack. Just that one? Yes. That's the only program yes. it's in, yeah. It's, and, not a, it's not a popular exercise I recommend. No, because yeah. it's if, if you do them right, they are incredible muscle builders. Yeah. But the proper way to do a, leg, a hanging leg raise is you have to go, your pelvis has to rotate up. That's yeah. the part of the abs... That's working. It's, it's not bringing the legs part. up. The legs are just the lever. Mm -hmm. The lever is long because your legs are long, and it's not the hips that you want to flex. That's it's your the, resistance in a yes, sense. Yes, you want to get the pelvis to rotate up and squeeze the core. So and, it's not just bringing the legs up. It's rotating the and pelvis. And by the way, it's this exercise is very hard for most people. Strong yeah. people. Even people who think that they can, they can do it, most people do it wrong. Yes. Mm -hmm. Most people use mostly hip flex. This is why I don't like using it until I've got somebody who really understands how to do that. So let me give you an example of what I'm talking about to kind of illustrate this. If, imagine I'm on the ground and I'm laying flat on my back and I have my arms out over my head and then I just do this with my arms, okay? That's the, that's the equivalent of what people do with leg raises. And you'd be like, you're not working your abs. You're just moving your arms. Well, that's what people are doing with their legs. Yeah. Now you may feel some of it in your abs because your abs have to stabilize, yeah. but that's what's happening. Now, if I wanted to do this and work my core, my arms stay in position and I roll up mm -hmm. and, and work the core. It's the same thing with hanging leg raises. Think of it as a hanging reverse crunch. That's yeah. what you're trying to do. And if your knees are bent, it's easier. If your legs so are straight, it's harder. Then you'd probably say like we refer them to your hip flexor deactivator uh, uh, video. video first in terms of like the technique of being yeah. able to uh, connect there within that position and then move towards um, your reverse crunch. And then what do you call that? Is it a Roman chair? I call it Roman chair. It is a leg lift, right? No, it, it's not. It, yeah, it's a Roman it, chair. It, your arms are pushing down and then you're doing yeah, leg lifts. That's what I call it. I don't um, think it's a Roman chair. But either way, I mean for me, in terms of scale, in terms of like progression, so yes. then that would be the next. And then we get up to where we're actually hanging because uh, that's very difficult just oh, to I, hang there and then and then quit You know, your body from moving. I'll regress it even more. This is what it would look like for me. Uh, laying flat on the ground, 
uh, reverse crunch first, flat on the ground. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Get, getting that down, knowing how to bring it with your knees tucked yep, in. Yep. Then you go to a, a decline bench. A and, slight decline. Yeah, slight decline bench and do that rolling up. Then you can incline it a little bit more yes, and roll it that's up. exactly yeah. And then you eventually get to the chair you're talking about and then roll it up. And then- Right, like a you, decline bench you're holding to. Yes. Yeah, See, and that's, then that's, that's you get- That's a Roman chair. I knew it. Oh, wow. Yeah. Well, what, what do you call the other one? I don't know. It's like a hanging leg raise apparatus. I have no okay. idea. Well, that's what oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Roman chair. I, that's, I, you know, I called it Roman chair Justin too forever. Maybe because I taught you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Adam, dude, set me up for failure. <laughs> well, you know, they, it that's did, rad. I'm going to blame everybody yeah, right. now. <laughs> it's me to her Justin like 15 years ago. So this is the Must Roman chair. Must have been an Adam really. thing. <laughs> yeah. Hey, well, look, it did originate in uh, Rome. So I, What do so they I call it right there? Just a, a vertical <laughs> knee raise chair? Yeah. yeah. Well, that's yeah. a stupid name. That's a dumb name. That's a stupid name. <laughs> it even looks more like a chair. You're like sitting in. A yeah, chair. yeah. That's one, why I never questioned. Doesn't it. even relate never, to a chair. I never questioned it. No, the, remember that the function of the abs. The, think of okay. This is your spine. The function of the abs are they attach here at the lower rib cage and at the pelvis. They have to they have to flex the spine in order to move through their full range of motion yeah, to roll it up. To roll it up. Right. The the hips. It, now it can stabilize with hip flexor exercise. This is why people, but I, but I feel it burn. I feel mm-hmm. it burn. Well, yes, it's holding on and stabilizing, but you're not really working. You know, Somebody needs to understand that your your spine can stay like this, and you could literally do this with your hips. Yeah, I'm doing it right now. So that's I'm so, doing the, this right now is hip and flexor. And if the if the action of the abs is to roll the spine up, and yet you do this with the hips all day long, which is what people do with leg raises and knee ups yes. all the time. Yes. And the only reason why they kind of feel the abs is, like you said, as they come up and they come down, the abs help kind of stabilize the deceleration yes. of the of the legs coming down. So they do feel some abs, but it's not direct hitting no. the abs at all. It's a terrible exercise. And so I would regress it back to, like I said, on the floor, then a slight incline, yes. then a more incline, then this the chair that Justin and I thought was the Roman chair, and then leg raises. And that's a, a long, like you should do one of those for weeks mm-hmm. and then the next one for weeks you consistently. You get good at it first. It's yeah, really you're not targeted. doing that for a while before you get to something like that, in my opinion. Like we're really good. Unless totally. you already have a pretty strong core and it are a little more advanced in, in your But like- once you get there, this is like the ab building exercise, one of the most high resistance ab exercise, if you do it right. Well, that's why it's high yeah. resistance. So if you get to the place where you have really strong abs and then you just do some leg races every now and then, because not everybody does it bad. I've seen like really fit. I could, I do, I could do maybe 12 or 15 max. And I, you guys know my course pretty well, strong. I, I train it right at most, right? right Usually it's eight to 10. You get people doing those windshield wiper ones, you know, yeah. <laughs> lazy, all, they all fancy with yeah. it. Yeah. Next question is from Elsa Vasquez. What should you do if you sleep wrong? Is that your body telling you something? <laughs> Define wrong. I know. I said, you know. Yeah, I know. I was awake all night. I slept wrong. <laughs> uh, no, I, oh, probably, that was wrong. They're probably referring to when you wake up and you have a stiff neck um, okay. or your shoulder hurts. You know, this is just poor sleep usually. Usually poor sleep can result in pain and inflammation. Um, also, previous injuries can sometimes show up. Uh, when you're in bed, not moving. So like you, know, you got a stiff shoulder, but because you're moving it all day, you don't notice as much. Then you're in bed, you're laying on it, not moving for eight hours. Then the pain uh, kind of shows up. But when people would come to me with this, and we, even when I would experience this, if I improve the quality of my sleep, like if I didn't look at electronics two hours before, made sure the room was cool, uh, make sure that the room was pitch black, didn't have stimulants past a certain point uh, or time of the day, I just didn't wake up feeling achy. Mm-hmm. I felt really good. Um, I actually noticed the reduction in inflammation for, from using the Uller too. That's uh, one of the companies we work with because it kept my bed cool. So, I mean, I would say this, uh, what you should, what should you do if you sleep wrong? Is that, is that your body telling you something, something? Well, yeah, it's telling you that you slept wrong. <laughs> it's yeah. the, so let's just take like an example of like you, uh, your pillow was too elevated, and so then your ne- your neck is all stiff. Or yeah. uh, you were on your side, so your shoulder like mm-hmm. fell asleep, and so then your shoulder's all stiff. This is where like Prime Pro is magical, in my opinion. So this is like a perfect example of if someone, like a client told me an area like that, I would send them videos from our Prime Pro. So if they did slept wrong on their, their neck and their neck was all locked mm-hmm. up and stiff, I would say do the exercises for the neck in Prime Pro, and that'll help prime you, warm you up, yep. and then go about your normal day. 
if that was in the shoulder, hip, whatever, name your name your place. We address all that in Prime Pro, and they they're all mobility drills and priming drills to get you ready. And so I would have them do that. That's yeah, that would be my advice. Yeah, a lot of times advice. too, it's like the preceding day. Like maybe you had an intense workout, or you had something that you're where you're um, like I was doing yard work or whatever, and I I just was super tight going into sleep, and then I slept in a position that aggravated those same muscles that I had like super tight already wake up and I'm just stiff and, and locked up. And, but yeah, like opening it up with mobility exercise is going to help a lot with that. Sometimes that just doesn't mean anything other than like, that's just, you know, the position you're locked up into and yeah. maybe, you know, maybe you do it going into sleep. So that way your body, uh, you know, won't have that tendency to kind of tighten up and firm and feel like it needs to provide stability uh, while you're laying. Yeah. There. You know, also too, as you start to develop muscle or as you start to lose weight, the pillows that you use and your sleep positions may have to change. So like if you're muscular, you need a bigger pillow. Like, you know, when you're muscular, well, you got big arms and shoulders, you need more pillow to keep your head. In I need a one to position. hug, dude. I'm serious. I need one to hug. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sleep and I'm hugging this pillow, dude. Does it have a face on this it? has nothing to do with your fetishes, bro. Don't go there on this. <laughs> hey, was, hey, hey, I drew a face hey. on it. Listen, it helps. Well, hey, so okay, well, here's something that we're, we're not really. I mean, Sal's starting to go that way right now. So I guess if you if you are consistently feeling uh, pain or stiffness in yeah. the same area every time because you uh, th then you do need to look into your bed, your pillow, yeah. uh, your sleep routine, getting ready for bed. So your body could be telling you that. So right. So I guess uh, maybe that's what this person is asking. So if you are chronically feeling this this same stiff neck, the same st all the time, and adjust what you're how yeah. you're sleeping. Yeah. So there there absolutely could be something with the mattress that you're using, the pillow that you're mm -hmm. using, even how you get ready for bed. Two, and two if of you're the biggest your hips hurt, and you maybe need a wedge pillow in there, you know, for your hips. Two, two. Those are the two. I was just gonna say the two biggest places where people mess up is the pillow is the wrong size for their the size of their shoulders and their neck mobility, and they need a pillow between their legs. In fact, the bigger my legs get, if I bulk and get bigger legs, I need to put a pillow between them. Otherwise, my hips can start to bother me. What was that great company we worked with that for a while there? Especially Pluto. With, what Pluto pillow? Mm -hmm. Yeah, they customize your pillow for that. One. I thought that was a really cool company that we, yeah. we only worked with them for. So a hold small on. While. So Justin, you hug a pillow and you have one between your legs. <laughs> I don't have one That's between my legs. Just <laughs> one, one. No, no thrusting if it, going if it's on. It's a hip thing. It goes down below. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll see you tomorrow. That's hilarious. Yeah. Next question is from C Moss twenty three. Does blending foods make the nutrients more bioavailable? Oh, what a good question. D depends, and uh, people take this to crazy levels. So, yeah. blending foods breaks them down, right? Increases the, the 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 ratio of surface area to volume, thus making it technically easier to break down. But people forget this. Chewing Is food. The rate of absorption change with well, that? Well, chewing food, yes, you break it down to smaller bits, but the chewing process also produces digestive enzymes in the gut and in the mouth. Yeah. So when you just blend and drink food very quickly- You're bypassing that You're process. bypassing a very important signaling process. So like if you just blended your meat and drank it all the time and think, well, I could get more food down this way and I could digest it more- I bet you you would probably find digestive issues as a result. Now, in some mm -hmm. cases, you need mechanical ways of breaking foods down. For example, wheat. Like, you ain't going to grab wheat off the stalk or whatever, chew on it, and be okay. We have to mill the shit out of it in order to make it uh, bioavailable. This is true for a lot of plant foods um, where you really have to break them down or cook them, Right. Otherwise, this is largely oversold. The whole like doesn't you know, it? Well, isn't there isn't there a a, a a role that the the air and oxygen plays in the the value of the nutrients too? Like if you blend it up like that, like if it, I know I, I remember reading like if you left like a like if you blended like a um, a smoothie or whatever and you let it sit overnight in your refrigerator and then you drank it the next day, some of the nutrient value would go down or degraded. oh I don't know yeah I'm, I'm you've never sure heard that? that no I I do know that with certain like. Um, hmm. I know that if you, for example, make potatoes or rice and then store them and reheat them, some of the starch becomes resistant. I'm talking about fruits in general. Yeah, like I don't know fruits about fruits and vegetables in general. Because it gets oxidized. Yeah, yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not sure. And, about the, that. and the process happens so much faster when it's been blended. Mm. Different if it's fruit is sitting in its the hole. Skin's a protective. That's right. Barrier, when the, when the fruit is sitting in its hole, its hole, its hole, and the skin is on there. Could you look that up for Doug? Maybe for me, and maybe you can fact check. Uh, Sounds logical. Yeah. Well, you know, here's the other thing too. That this is why I'm not a big fan of blending food. Uh, talk about smoothies. Whenever do you eat? 
you know, three apples, two bananas, and an avocado all at once, right? Almost never. But you'll blend the shit out of that and make it a smoothie. Go get yourself a, well, that's why I don't a like Jamba ju Juice. I'm not a big fan of juicing or juicers because you have to go through. You have to have so much, so concentrated. Oh, it's like 100 grams of sugar, and yeah, one, yeah. which you would never do if you yeah. ate the fruit. If you juice vegetables, that's one thing. That's another because the vegetables are so low. In you want to know what else, too. You know a lot of- uh, But fruit is real, really hot. There's a case, and I actually believe this, this case. There's, you know, we have to remove our wisdom teeth, right? Oh, we got to get rid of our wisdom teeth all the time. Do you know that children who grow up chewing on tough things, it actually spreads their palate and creates space for the teeth to come in? Mm -hmm. So when mm -hmm. babies are fed constant baby food that's blended up, they're, are, are, we develop smaller jaws and we have less space uh, for teeth. So that chewing process, there's much more to it than just it breaks the food into smaller bits. There's a lot of physiological things that are happening and there's a lot of value in that. And of course, for most of human evolution, we didn't have blenders. So it kind of makes sense. What does it say there? It's, it's, uh, it does, but it says it's not going to be great. Oh, okay. So because of oxidation. Yes. Yeah. I don't think it makes that big of a difference. I'm not a huge food, a fan of well, by the way, blending shit up except for enjoying a smoothie. I like the way Also talking about the bioavailability by blending or not blending. We're, we're also talking about things that I would never talk to a client about. Like if you're splitting hairs at that rate, like trying to increase the bioavailability yeah. of it by blending it up. It or, makes sense. Or, or to what I was bringing up, worrying about the oxygenation of it. It's like, come on, at the end of the it day. It can make sense for certain plant foods. Like- Chlorella, for example. Chlorella is, is very nutrient dense, you know, in, in plant terms. Uh, algae, I think chlorella is an algae, if I'm not mistaken. But if you if you try to eat it and chew on it, it ain't going to get anything. You have to break it down and break it down and mill it. Same thing with wheat, same thing with other vegetables. You can cook plants and that'll help quite a bit. Uh, but for the most part, like the chewing process, there are things that happen in the brain, the body, like I said, like I said digestive enzymes. Uh, hormones and chemicals that release that are from the chewing process that you bypass when you drink your food. And again, I'm going to go back to babies. We feed babies because you know they don't have teeth or whatever, but it actually changes the shape of our jaws. And children who don't chew on tough things tend to need braces yeah. and tend to run out of room for their teeth. Whereas when kids are allowed to chew on tough things like they do in, in ancestral cultures, mm -hmm. they don't need to remove their wisdom teeth. They actually can fit everything. So- Next question is from Fabish K. Do performing squats, deadlifts, and overhead presses make you shorter? <laughs> <laughs> so is that what happened, Doug? In. Were yeah. you big? Were you big overhead yeah, presser? Yeah, very big. He was six seven six, before. Six, yeah, he been crushing. I've been way. pounded into the ground. You know what's funny? <laughs> okay, so so this is a funny question. It reminds me of the old myth, like with the children lifting, yes. and they just stunt your growth. You know, that's what they used to tell you. And okay, so you know, oh, it's, yeah, you know, it still persists. You know, what's funny about this is that people as they age do get shorter. But it's not because no, it's they're, they're lifting heavy shit. Yeah, it's, it's literally because their bones are deteriorating. Deteriorating yeah. and they're, and and they're, they're rounding. Weaker. Yeah, they're, even they're, if they're, you close, they're closing up. Yeah, and even if you straighten them the out. space between their vertebrae and yeah. everything else. Even is, if you, yes, even if you straighten them out, they're shorter. Yeah. But it's the opposite. Lifting heavy things, first off, lift it appropriately, right? You can injure yourself. But lifting heavy things appropriately over the years, over the decades, for your entire life- Slow that Will maintain down. your height. That's right. It won't make you shorter. It'll keep you from getting shorter. And in multiple ways, because you're right, your, your bones like are going to deteriorate. But you also, you I think like when- So for example, my uncle always talks about this, my uncle Casey, who you guys know, because he was, you know, he says he was 6'4", six, 6'3", six, and he's like two, a good two inches shorter than me now. But he's also got terrible posture too. Yeah, so that too. Half of it is like the rounding of the back yep. and closing in, yep. and then also to your point, what's going on. So, and both are improved by weight training. Mm -hmm. If you get if you perform a really good squat and overhead press for most of your life, you're going to have pretty damn good posture. You'll maintain it. Re it. it requires good posture in order yes. to do that. So you're already going to be standing upright more, and you're going to strengthen your bones, which will slow down the process of that deterioration. Yeah, I remember my great grandmother. Uh, she passed away years ago, but she had um, humpback. You know, you've seen that. You see that sometimes in, in older people. That's literally bones getting weak and you get these kind of micro fractures and then they heal and you start to create this question mark back. Um, and that's not the result of lifting heavy things. It's the result of, uh, of not lifting heavy things, of not strengthening your bones, of sitting in particular positions over time, not offsetting, you know, those positions. I feel like this person was watching a lot of cartoons, like Tom and Jerry or something. Like, <laughs> yeah. Just all this weight smashing them down and they, like an accordion, they just shrink down. Yeah, yeah. no, it yeah. doesn't work. Don't worry, I got Look, if you like our information, head over to mindpumpfree.com and check out our guides. We have guides that can help you with almost any health or fitness goal. You can also find all of us on social media. So Justin is on Instagram at Mind Pump Justin. Adam is on Instagram at Mind Pump Adam. And you can find me on Twitter at Mind Pump Sal. 
the rules that apply to somebody who is going from a man who's going from 20% body fat to 15%, the rules that apply to that person are the same as All the, the rules same. that go from 10% to 5%. The difference is everything that we talked about.